for coming. Uh, this is um, our second studio visit for the Prelude Festival and uh, featuring the Builders Association. So first, thank them uh, so much for coming. Give them a round of applause. Um, I just wanted to give you, a, uh, my name is Andrew Kircher. I'm the curator of the festival this year. I wanted to give you a little sense of what you're gonna see tonight, what this model is. Um, I was hoping, given that we're at the Siegel Center, we're at the Graduate Center, we could take a moment to uh, appreciate not only work in progress, but the critical discourse that can surround a work. And so we invited each of the artists that are in the studio visits to one, uh, give you a sense of where this work fits into a larger artistic project, to share the work, and then also we together invited someone, in this case Helen Shaw, to facilitate a, a deeper conversation about the work. Um, and so that's what we're gonna do today. Uh, I have nothing more to say except to hand the microphone off and thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, hi. Hi everyone, uh, we are the Builders Association as was previously stated. Um, <laughs> that's Dan Dobson, the sound designer, Hannah Heller, Mo Angelos, James Gibbs, Katie Brook, Sean Donovan, yeah, Jennifer Tipton, our lighting designer, Sharon Connolly, our board member. So, um, and uh, phoning it in from Santa Cruz, California, Marianne Weems. Hi, Marianne. Uh, and, and millions of viewers around the world. Um, <laughs> this is being live streamed. Um, so we are <laughs> a performance ensemble based here in New York City and uh, we have some people that are theater and performance people and we have uh, a lot of other folks who come from various disciplines, uh, design, architecture, fine art, um, et cetera. And so that uh, tends to make our work quite interdisciplinary because our process is uh, pretty radically interdisciplinary, I would say. Um, and we even um, scoop up in that net people who have no interest whatsoever in theater. Um, <laughs> but they are moved to um, give it a shot, right? <laughs> so um, we've created uh, 17 large-scale productions which have toured to over 80 venues over the last 20 plus years. Um, let's just name a few. Lincoln Center, BAM, Maison des Arts in Paris, um, Rome, Bogota, um, Dan says we were never in Berlin, so I'm not gonna say that one. Um, and also more unexpected venues, uh, such as V2 in Rotterdam, uh, Stein in Amsterdam, the Whitney, the Guggenheim, and our last four shows had their uh, New York premieres at BAM. So it takes, mm, at the minimum, two years, I would say, uh, to make one of these shows, and uh, you can all buy a very handsome book put out by MIT Press about the research and development process. It really breaks it down. There's lots of pictures. It'll look good on the coffee table. Um, so, James. So, yeah, um, there's a few pictures that are actually from that book up on the screen, and you've probably noticed, um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the builder's work, there's a lot of tech and a lot of media in our work. Um, and one of the things that Marianne likes to say about the work is that it's 21st century storytelling to tell 21st century stories. Um, which is to say that for the most part, the stories that we tell involve media. They involve some of this technology and screens and some of the, um, the drama and dramaturgy of the stories that's actually transacted um, through media. So uh, our goal is to make this, um, the media work and the performance um, integrated and intrinsic to the shows themselves. Um, the other thing is that we build the shows with the creative team in place. Um, and that is, that's one of the reasons, in addition to fundraising, why it can take like two years to build one of these shows. Um, the goal really is to, um, to bring the designers and the, um, the tech and the media to the table at the beginning um, and not to, say, set the text um, before those designers have done their work. So again, the, the, the goal of that is to move each element of the stagecraft forward at the same time um, instead of just bringing in media um, towards the end. Uh, and sometimes that actually means you know, that, that Mo and I, who have uh, co-written the last couple of shows, have had in mind like whole lines that we've basically deleted from the text because they're being carried um, on stage by the media. Um, so just to give a little bit of a context for, for this work that we're doing um, on this, the Ayn Rand uh, piece, um, we just wanted to talk briefly about a couple of other shows, um, House Divided, uh, Sontag Reborn, and Elements of Oz. 
Um, House Divided was our show, which is a, a mashup of John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath and the 2008 uh, mortgage-backed um, securities crisis uh, that unfolded in the financial system, really almost took the financial system down. Um, so that, that show uh, basically um, mixed up Steinbeck with primary source material from the, the crash, uh, quarterly investor calls from um, uh, Lehman Brothers right before Lehman went down, from Bear Stearns and from Goldman Sachs, and then also finally the, um, the testimony of Alan Greenspan at the SEC hearing where he confessed to being surprised that the market um, wasn't doing what he expected and thought that it should do and what he had spent the last 20 plus years uh, steering the, the, the basis on which he had spent the last 25 years um, steering the US economy. Um, and you'll see Alan Greenspan has become like a recurring character in the builder's work. He's sort of working on a cycle of Alan Greenspan stories. Um, so that's just to set that up a little bit. Um, let's watch this video, uh, a, a little video of um, House Divided that includes Marianne uh, talking about the work probably better than I just did. So actual people in the show are telling actual stories about their displacement and what they're doing with their lives now. And those stories are intercut with John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath, a great American classic, which is about Americans from a previous generation from the 1930s whose farm has been repossessed by the banks and who set out on a road towards California. It's our land. We measured it, broke it up. That don't make it yours. The production has the builder's usual aesthetic mix of media and live performance. There's a very rich soundtrack that's being played live on stage, and there are layers of video that are projected onto a house, a foreclosed house that we were fortunate enough to get our hands on and cut up and repurpose as the actual set for the show. So the house is a very singular character on stage, and it's sort of a container for these ideas about these broken homes. I just returned from London, where we are setting up our new European mortgage origination effort. We believe Did you hear that? Business is what? No. They're going into Europe. Go back on the crawl. These guys don't wait for the seatbelt sign, do they? If Bear's writing mortgages in Europe, other big banks there are going to take a hit. Hello. Are you having problems meeting your payments? default on your mortgage. Nationwide Home is now the servicer of your mortgage. And to prevent you from losing your home and all your equity, please call us back at 1-888-SICK-CLOUD and speak with a customer service representative. Uh, we go in and clean out foreclosed homes uh, for uh, realtors or banks, get them ready for uh, resale. The usual definition of trash out is cleaning out any uh, leftover items from the previous owner uh, that they weren't able to take with them, usually to include uh, furniture, clothes, toys, uh, kitchenware, that kind of deal. As personal uh, items go, uh, found obviously boxes of pictures, uh, travel trinkets uh, that people have uh, bought. Um, it, it amazes me the stuff that I, I do find that they, they do leave behind that uh, I think you or I would probably uh, at least want to take with us.
waking up to the American investment bank Lehman Brothers has filed for bankruptcy in New York. That's happened in the last few minutes. It means the Wall Street institution, which has been in business for 150 years and survived the Great Depression, is now the most high-profile casualty of the credit crunch. Lehman Brothers, Brothers, the fourth largest U.S. investment bank, says it's filing for bankruptcy protection. And now that the bank is being closed for its new board by Bank of America, there's $15 million. But I would like to mention that the takeover of Bank of America is extraordinarily Okay, so that's, that's a little illustration, I guess, of the way that the builders are um, concerned uh, not only about character, but about um, characters, but about systems as well, including um, financial systems. Um, uh, Sontag Reborn is a much smaller piece, um, and I'll just say a, a couple of words about that. Um, it's, it's more of a chamber piece. That was a one-woman piece, and probably closer to the scale of what this Ayn Rand piece is, is going to end up being. Um, Sontag uh, herself was a friend to the company, uh, and that, um, that piece basically uses her journals and some media to um, <coughs> to show her creating Sontag, the, the public intellectual and writer, um, through using those journals and through using um, her later annotations of those journals uh, as Sontag, the, the great intellectual. Um, uh, the last little piece I wanted to talk about, the last big piece I want to talk about is Elements of Oz, our last big show, which was um, a retelling of the, the Oz story, which is a story that comes back up during depression. It's part of the kind of tradition of escapism uh, in, in entertainment. Um, but it's also a story that people tend to um, try to take possession of, and it was about that as well. Um, one of the allegories of Oz, some of you might be aware of this, is that it's um, a financial, people propose or believe that it's a financial allegory, and that the yellow brick road represents the gold standard, the, um, the slippers, which are silver uh, in the books, not ruby, represent bimetallism, adding, gold, adding silver to the gold standard, uh, tin man, industrial workers, scarecrow, all of that. Um, and in, in the Oz show, uh, we actually ended up uh, mentioning Alan Greenspan again and using Ayn Rand to kind of um, give people a little bit of, a, of an inroads into some of the financial stuff behind that um, allegory. Uh, and we, we dug up this uh, 1959 Nine. interview uh, with Mike Wallace and Ayn Rand, um, and we'll show a little bit of that uh, as well. Um, for those of you, this will just be silent just so you can see, but um, for those of you who don't know, perhaps you all know, Ayn Rand is kind of like the prophet of the free market, uh, of, of capitalism and, uh, and greed is good, um, and, and I think a huge, uh, well, clearly a huge influence on people who are in power uh, in the U.S. now, and like I said about Alan Greenspan, people who've been in, in charge of the financial system for some time. Um, so, so uh, yeah, we were uh, working with this clip and um, you know this is 1959 this is her first television interview not many people had really been on TV yet at that point and so people don't understand how to be telegenic you know so she's not looking at the camera she's you know like a cornered animal or something you know she's nervous right and her eyes are like darting back and forth like this and when uh, we were watching it you know we were saying oh yeah that's like that's a trauma response right like people um, track their eyes back and forth when they're remembering a trauma or um, if they're trying to sort of cope with a stressful situation. So, and James said, oh, um, Ayn Rand, trauma response, that's a great title. So um, here we are. <laughs> so, and just to, just to say further, I mean, in a way that it began with looking at this video and then we started talking about what that really meant. And um, Ayn Rand always uh, basically presented herself as like sweet generous, like zero influences. She occasionally would say that Aristotle had been an influence, but that was it. <laughs> Nobody else. Um, and, and she also was uninterested in um, like airing the dirty laundry of her history and, and where she came from and, and insisted that it had no bearing whatsoever on her work or her life. And, and that's actually the thing that we're, we're most interested in in Ayn Rand. And I think that she's an opportunity to, um, for, for the builders to combine some of these um, interests that we've had in systems and in biography and in character. Um, so she's, she's uh, in fact, uh, born Alyssa Zinovievna Rosenbaum. And 
Ayn Rand was born um, to, to a pretty prosperous upper middle class Jewish family in St. Petersburg. And at the age of five, basically witnessed the revolution, lost everything, and fled to America penniless, um, and then created Ayn Rand out of that. So, so trauma response kind of began with this video, and it's a little bit jokey, but, but really it's an interesting side of this person. And whatever, whatever, wherever you fall on your opinion about her, her work, her philosophy, her writing, um, it's, a, it's a fascinating and actually kind of sympathetic story. And so that's, that's one of our big interests. And with that, I guess I'll yeah. leave you guys there. Yeah. saw Elisa off to the train station on January 17th, 1926 on her way to America? Uh, I, uh, Natasha, and Mama saw her off. I don't remember if Papa was there or not. How long did Elisa plan her visit in America to be? Oh, I think she was planning to go there for good. She wanted to get me, Papa, and Mama out to the U.S. How did Elisa change when she moved to America? She became more egoistic and made egoism into a philosophy. Try living by such a philosophy. Then you can judge whether it is rational or not. When Elisa was leaving Russia, she thought she was going to the mecca of the film industry to make her career. Uh, her correspondence was of an impulsive nature. I recall such sentences from her letters as, I am Cecil B. DeMille's scenario writer, and I got married. I think she wanted to stun us with her successes. remember of Cousin Alice's visit to Chicago in 1926? Well, Mother told me that because Alice was coming to stay with us, we had to move our beds around. We didn't have another bedroom. There wasn't room for people to stay with us in our apartment. We had five of us, all sleeping in two bedrooms and a dining room. Harvey and I always laugh because we had to give up our beds in the dining room to her. We had two little cots in the dining room, and we had to move out because she had her typewriter in the dining room, and that's where she slept. What did she like to talk about? 
Oh, she talked about the theater and about politics and her ideas, and she would get very excited and strong about it. She wrote stories when she was there, and the typewriter was always clacking away. She was just a cousin who came to Chicago and could hardly speak English. And we didn't know she was going to be a great writer with great ideas. She was just another one of the greenhorns that Grandpa and the uncles and aunts brought in. But we wanted everybody to live in the land of milk and honey. Did she take to America? I'm sitting on top of the world. I remember her singing that over and over again. <laughs> She kind of drove us crazy because she was up all night and then we were up all day. And she would take showers at night and she was a night person. And I don't know if they had showers in Russia, but she just loved to take a shower at night. How would you describe her then? Well, she wasn't pretty. She was very angular and she wore very short hair. And she was very opinionated. Did she have clear political views then? Oh, I think so. She hated and hated and hated the Bolsheviks, as she used to call them. She thought they were the worst people on earth, and they were the ones who ruined all of her good living, uh, the good life that they had before that. And she was adamant about that. She had a great deal of hate for the Red Russians. She would talk about that all the time. Murderers, killers, thieves, terrible people. She hated communism. Did she miss her family? She always wanted her sister to come. I know she told me that. Uh, Eleonora, she wished her whole family was here, but especially she wanted that sister to come. She wanted her to see America. What's your strongest memory of Ayn Rand? When she lived at our house when I was a little girl, I helped her pick out her new name, Rand. She had this little old Remington Rand typewriter, and she had it on our dining room table, and one day she said, I'm going to change my name, but I want it to be an A and an R. And we called her Alice. She said, I picked out my first name. It's, it's going to be Ein. It's sort of a Finnish derivative, she told me. And she said, I need an R. And I was looking at the typewriter. So then I said, what about Rand? And she said, oh, good, that's it, I'm Rand. And I think that was early on in her visit. She must have been excited to get her new name. Oh, yeah, yeah. She wanted to start new and be American. August 28, 1926. Hello, Loyola. I am writing to you as a real American resident. I am so Americanized that I can walk in the streets without raising my head to look at the skyscrapers. I sit in a restaurant on very high chairs like in futuristic movie sets and use a straw to sip fruit cocktails brought to me by a real Negro. I have learned to cross the street without getting hit by a car while traffic cops yell, come on girl, to me. Not taking anything too seriously is the chief rule, rule Americans adhere to. Everybody makes fun of everybody else, but very wittily, and that is the essence of America. The language here is not English at all, and it is all jokes and wisecracks, as they are called here. The only thing that remains for me is to rise which I am doing with my characteristic straight line decisiveness. I speak English now, and I even think in English, but write me here. If you come to Chicago, I will meet you at the train station. Even if you arrive in 20 years, even if I am by then the greatest star in Hollywood. I just hope you have nothing against photographers and reporters following me and all my friends around as is customary with stars. At least, I hope it will be that way. No, I do not want to talk about Russia. Okay, uh, you came to America when you were about 20 or 21 years old? That's right. And you went to Hollywood. Was this because of your interest in screenwriting? Uh, yes, uh, but not ultimately. I could barely speak English. I certainly couldn't write it, and it was um, at that time the day of silent movies. So I had figured out that I could uh, be able to write a scenario, but not yet, dialogue. Mm. 
That's why I decided I would start with a screen. But uh, my first ambition was always novels. Uh, you did earn your living in, 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 in the early years in Hollywood in a variety of ways, I suppose. Oh, I had a bad struggle, yes. I had to hold odd jobs, and I even waited on tables, and the first day I tried it, I was fired <laughs> right there. But uh, uh, the last job of that kind, I was there a whole week. <laughs> so uh, that I was learning, but uh, it was the year of the Depression, you know, and uh, it was very difficult. I held all kind of jobs which were very, very boring, but I was able to write. Was that good? for one's character to have to suffer that way? No, I don't think so. I think the only good is later. It gives you a certain self-confidence if you can overcome it and rise above it. But as such, I don't think hardships are good for anyone. But uh, one of my relatives, uh, one of my mother's cousins owned a movie theater in Chicago, a small neighborhood theater. So she gave me a letter of introduction to the DeMille studio. DeMille at that time had an independent studio of his own in Culver City. Uh, what he was famous for is society, glamour, sex, and adventure. And I liked all of his films I had seen in Russia. He was my particular idol of the American screen. When I arrived at the studio, I went to the publicity department and presented that letter and I told them what I was interested in was a junior screenwriter's job, if it was possible. And you know, I walk out of that studio and it's uh, that kind of colonial mansion in Culver City, which uh, was Pathé later. And there's a, dr a driveway in front uh, of the main building that goes through a gate. And as I start walk down the driveway, I see an open roadster parked and a man at the wheel talking to somebody else inside the car. And it was DeMille. So it wasn't too long before he started driving. He drives up to the gate, stops, looks at me and asks, why are you looking at me? I told him, I had just come from Russia, and I'm very happy to see him. So, he looks me up and down, opens the door of the car, and says, get in. I didn't know where we were going. I got in, and he started driving. Now, isn't that a fantastic story? Shall we talk about my work? December 4th, 1936. The first purpose of this book is a defense of egoism in its real meaning. The fountainhead is about individualism versus collectivism, not in politics, but in man's soul. The reason I chose architecture as the background is because it is a field of work that covers both art and the basic need of men's survival. And because one cannot find a more eloquent symbol of man as creator than a man who is a builder. His antithesis, the collectivists, are destroyers. Publishers Little and Brown said, This is a work of almost genius. Genius, in the power of its, its expression, almost in the sense of its enormous bitterness. High grade literature, very intellectual. There's no readership for it. I said to Frank, if someone doesn't appreciate it, well, that's their bad standards. But to have it rejected because it's too good, that is really a feeling of honor. Finally, after 12 rejections, the Fountainhead was published on May 8, 1943, and I knew I would have to sell 100,000 copies to reach my kind of reader. July 3rd, 1934. 
Dear Mr. DeMille, this letter is primarily to express my gratitude to you at the distance of so many years. I have always wanted to tell you how much I appreciated your kindness and interest in me at a time when, if you remember, I was a very inexperienced, very bewildered and frightened little immigrant from Russia. If I have achieved any kind of success, I owe it to your instructions, which I have remembered and tried to follow all these years. I have always hoped that the day would come when I would be successful enough to show you that you had not wasted the attention you had given me at my start in Hollywood. I am taking the liberty of sending you a synopsis of my story, Red Pawn, which Paramount has just bought as a possible vehicle for Marlon Dietrich. If you would be kind enough to read it, I would be very grateful. Uh, grant me a little time to see you afterwards. Ayn Rand, or Caviar, as you used to call me. I met Ayn Rand in 1946 when I was her secretary when she did The Fountainhead at Warner Brothers Studios. I lived with Ayn and Frank in their house in the valley for a matter of months in 1946. I was more or less a glorified errand boy. She had beautiful eyes, black hair, very beautiful lips and very prominent lips a lovely face, not especially big, but a beautiful smile. But boy, you looked at that woman and you knew that was a dynamic personality. There was a lot of sex in her face. It was amazing. She was a very sensual woman. You could feel a sensuality about her. She'd ask me about Hollywood, what I knew, she was always interested in Hollywood people, what they were like and what their lives were and that sort of thing. Oh, she liked music. She had a kind of cute little trick. She'd walk around with a cane and tap it on the floor and do a semi-tap dance routine. She'd come in at night with a cane and walk around swinging her cane, doing a little two-step that was a la Dietrich. Maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Oh, there'd be music on the radio, as I recall. Frank and I'd look and watch and laugh. It was quite fascinating. She was adorable. November 24th, 1934, dear Miss Wick, I am motoring to New York and expect to be there by December 20. I am looking forward to seeing you. I do not know where I will stop, but I will telephone you as soon as I arrive. I hope this opportunity to come to New York will help me with I, my book, Atlas Shrugged, as you have suggested. was what Ayn Rand jokingly called her salon. Tell me about the collective during those Saturday evening gatherings. Uh, Ayn would usually arrive after most of the others and, and all the men would rise to their feet as a gesture of respect. There was a lot of reverence and hero worship directed at Miss Rand. Sometimes it was like being in a room with a person treated as a demigod. Miss Rand never asked for that openly, but she had to be aware of it, and perhaps she could have changed it, but she didn't. The evenings were primarily very serious, stimulating discussions about art, philosophy, politics, hardly ever light conversations, very little laughter or casual socializing, and lots of cigarette smoking. I was one of the few non-smokers, so to sit there and see particularly the girls with their cigarette holders trying to look like Ayn Rand. It, 
it was very sad. Talk about social metaphysics. And you had people in their 20s, in formative stages of their lives, sitting at the feet of a genius. Not only that, but many of them had no life except objectivism and Ayn Rand. Now, what do you expect to happen in that kind of relationship? They were immature, they were overawed, easily swayed, influenced, intimidated. Uh, it was overwhelming, and in some cases, psychologically and creatively stunting and paralyzing. And Alan Greenspan was there too. I am very pleased to present a woman. I, uh, there have been a number of people who have said, uh, uh, you're gonna, I know many of you have heard this line. Atlas Shrugged changed my life. The Fountainhead changed my life. Uh, here's a woman who's read by millions around the world. She may be our most debated uh, philosopher. She identifies that to which she adheres as objectivism. We'll talk about it. We care very much about your sharing with us your feelings about this most interesting lady, a warm human being who has a lot to say and comes straight at everything she says. I am pleased to present Ayn Rand. All right, let's dive right in. Miss Rand, I'm still not sure why you are so harsh on those who would sacrifice for others. Because it is a kind of cannibalism. Look at those people. Just look at them. They don't hesitate to sacrifice whole nations. Look at Russia. Communism is based on altruism. Look at Nazi Germany. The Nazis were more explicit than even the Russians in preaching self-sacrifice and altruism. And self-sacrifice for the state, for the folk, for the people. Every dictatorship is based in altruism. You can't fight it by merely saying it's a difference of opinion. It's a difference between life and death. Commercial break. And welcome back. So your view is then, if we all become more comfortable with our natural tendencies, uh, that is to say, selfishness, there would be less horror, less war, less Hitler. There wouldn't be any. Let's take your thesis then and accept it. Now I'm going to be selfish. I'm going to be a real talented and, and charismatic, and I'm going to have a lot of money and a lot of banks, and pretty soon nobody is going to be able to compete with me because I've already purchased all my competitors. And now I have dictatorial power over people and can name the price of bacon or the price of oil or whatever it is the commodity I'm selling. You know, I agree with you that you are very talented and you can accomplish a great deal and already have, but you are talking about the impossible. In a free society, nobody can become a monopolist or a dictator. The system itself, the free market, will destroy you. How do you explain mobile oil? Exxon, how do you explain the prices they're able to charge for oil? I think there are stupid appeasers who get too little and put up with too much. The oil companies, customers, the government, who? Uh, here, you'll have to let me explain. All right. OK, all this is economic fallacies. To begin with, nobody in a free market the government doesn't interfere can become a monopolist. All monopolies are created by a special privilege from government. It's only by an act of government that you can keep competitors out of your field. The power you hold as an industrial industrialist is the power of producing something of value. That people want. And it's the people who literally control you because every purchase is a vote in the favor of some businessman and in, in, in a way against all of the others. It's the public who decides what they want to buy and what they pass up. So, in other words, if I try to be Mr. Big, and charge outrageously high prices for gasoline. You'll go broke. All right, let's change trains for a moment and turn to our audience. I want to change the topic and, and go back to what you said about history. 15 years ago, I was impressed with your books. Uh, today, however, I am more educated, and I find that if a company and... This is what I don't want to answer. Well, wait a minute. You haven't heard the question yet. She's already estimated her position and my work. Incidentally, explain the quality of her brain. 
if she says today that she is more educated well i am more educated now than i was 15 years ago when i was in high school and before i read the newspapers i am not interested in your biography well let her make her point uh it's very basic if a company is permitted to do what it wants to do like itt you wind up with itt in nazi germany doing whatever it damn well pleases and any other company in the united states doing the same thing conglomerates can do whatever they want itt owns everything from baking companies to telephone companies to munitions plants and i mean i really think that's wrong well, Miss Rand thinks it's wrong too, but she's saying that it's not government force that's going to correct the problem. I don't believe that. I can't believe it because money is power. And the more money you have, the more power you have. I, uh, we encourage you to make a contribution to that observation. I will not answer anyone who is impolite. Oh, but she wasn't impolite. I do not sanction impoliteness, and I am not the victim of hippies. Hippies? That's where it started, the dropping of politeness and of manners. Okay, you are equating someone who disagrees with you with impoliteness. That's not fair. Oh, no? Huh. If you didn't interrupt me, I would not I would have demonstrated what I mean to show you that I am not evading the question. If anyone wants to ask the same question politely, I will be delighted to okay, answer. But there was nothing impolite. You are punishing this woman for the energy and vigor that she brought to the dialogue, and that's not fair. This is the kind of woman we spend a long time trying to attract to our television audience. I used to agree with you, but now I'm more educated. Okay, commercial break. And we're back. I right, new question. Do you see any reason for social aid, for welfare, for charity? But I want to answer the preceding question. Doesn't anybody want to ask politely? I'm surprised that someone with your intelligence, Ayn, can be so emotional in her approach. I didn't come here to be judged. I came here to answer questions. The question asked in the following form, I used to agree with you, but now I am more educated, is an insult which I cannot sanction. I am not interested in the woman's history. She didn't have to begin it that way. And that's what I want to register my protest against. I'm sorry, our time is up. It's a pleasure. Have a nice day, everybody. Goodbye. Services provided and promotional fees paid by the following. Announcing a new world car, Ford Escort, with road hugging four wheel independent. I knew that I was bringing her home to die. And she knew she was coming home to die. Uh, the doctor told both of us if she goes home, she will die. She wanted to go home and die, and she asked if I would take her home. But she was certain, and if I knew and cherished her, and if I cherished one thing of Ayn Rand, and if I shared one thing with Ayn Rand, it was a commitment to the right and the freedom of the individual to make choices. I would not or could not deprive her of that right. I said I would take her home to die. I do not wish to speak of my years in Russia, no. When I was five, my mother came into the playroom. The meaning of human life here on this earth is the joy one has achieved. The floor was littered with toys. Mother announced that we must choose some toys to put away and some to keep now. Suffering? Pain, humiliation, all this is an irrelevant accident. In a year, she said, we could trade the toys we had kept for those she put away. Natasha held on to her favorites, but I 
imagining the pleasure I would receive from having my favorite toys returned a whole year later, I gave her my best loved playthings. Human beings are in no sense inevitably the creatures of their environment. Mother took my mechanical wind-up chicken, the little thing with yellow and blue painted feathers made of tin. It made a noise when it wobbled along the floor. We do not have to be influenced or formed by the people and events around us. Exactly one year later, I asked for my toys back. We are free to make choices, to evaluate. She was amused. She explained that she had given everything to the orphanage. We are free to come to our own conclusions. She was smiling. Man is the being of self-made soul. Mother said that if I had really loved that chicken, I wouldn't have relinquished it in the first place. It is pointless to talk about childhood, parents, experiences. This was my first encounter with altruism. I am interested only in the future. Hi. 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 Um, uh, my name's Helen Shaw. I'm a critic. And uh, Andrew uh, very, very kindly asked me to give uh, a critical interaction <laughs> with, the, with the piece. Um, and I had a couple of thoughts, uh, and, then, and then one thing I wanted to, to spring on all of you. Um, <laughs> so uh, can I see a show of hands? Who, who here has seen a... This group here who has been introduced is not allowed to respond. Who has seen uh, <laughs> a, a Builder's Show before? Builder's Show, Builder's Show, Builder's Show, Builder's Show. All right. Builder's Show, interesting. Okay, um, so for those who haven't seen one, uh, you should know that, as you saw from the presentation in the beginning, that, that Builder's productions happen, um, uh, obviously they are very technologically complex, uh, and they use uh, projection and research in a, in a kind of a layering way. Uh, but what might not have been so obvious from the, from the presentation is that they, they operate the same way uh, against each other, so that the Builders Association is named for its first production, uh, and its first production is always kind of hovering behind every subsequent production. And so, in a way, the, the sort of the builder's um, kind of macro season, all, all <laughs> how many shows is it? 17? 17. 17 shows. They, they are all kind of readable uh, on top of each other in this kind of weird uh, palimpsest of, of, um, of uh, it's like, the, like, a, like a Wikipedia wormhole that <laughs> takes you all night. <laughs> and, uh, and one idea sort of leads to the next and leads to the next. And, and when James was talking about the history of the, of the pieces that it informed this one, uh, there are others that, that are also kind of readable inside the work they're constructing now. Um, one, for instance, is, uh, oh gosh, what's the one about data bodies? Super Thank you. Boy. Uh, I, in they they were the, one of the first companies to talk about the way that we interact with the data cloud with a data body that we um, that we construct around ourselves that that now uh, I'm sure you woke up this morning and thought I better not look on Amazon for um, <laughs> anything embarrassing because that will be associated with me until I die and 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 may in, and will surely be sold on to a series of uh, if not uh, commercial bodies uh, certainly the Russians. 
will know everything about you soon. As a <laughs> Yahoo user, I just discovered this morning that I will uh, be spammed, uh, I think, even after my death. So, the, um, <laughs> but that the, the idea of internet dramaturgy, this the kind of thinking that we do now that we interact with so much of our information on screen um, and, and through the kind of the multiple tabs open all the time that sit there like little reminders that we forget are there. Uh, someone said recently, uh, I, I feel a little sense of loss every time I have to restart my computer and I lose all my tabs. <laughs> and the idea that you lose all the things that you had made this sort of vague mental note to look up later, um, uh, like a little death every day. I thought that was quite charming. I, of course, haven't shut down my computer in three years, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure that w if I were to restart, that that's what would happen as well. And that, uh, and that Anne Rand at first seems to be a very, not, I mean, this is a cat who did not really coexist with the internet, obviously. Uh, she checked out before that was a big thing. And, um, but that she is uh, kind of an ur text, not only for those of us who, I, I would say most of us who uh, interact with the web, there's a, many of us read, uh, actually another show of hands, who has read anything by Anne Rand ever? Yeah, yeah, anyone who hasn't? James? No, no, I have, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> wow. I almost replaced him on the show just then. I don't know no. if you saw that. that was no, I, I read The yeah. Fountainhead. I yeah. was 16. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's good. But you do have to respond. Okay. So, but um, is that our current political system is also, uh, it's coded at a deep level, at an interestingly deep level by, by the things that Rand wrote. Uh, partially because we have a strain in our politics now, which is kind of forever 16. Uh, we're living in a kind of the, the weird future that we found ourselves in is this, this permanent, um, it's not infantilization, but it's this permanent high school, uh, we're in a permanent high school mentality. And not only do we, do we, um, do we watch only comic book movies, uh, but we also uh, have, a, have a politics which has frozen at the level of, um, of your uh, high school uh, you know, drama club. <laughs> and uh, with, s with a similar level of sophistication in its politics. So the, uh, the thing, uh, you know, I, I s so I did a bit of reading about Rand. I had not thought about Rand, I guess not really consciously. Uh, 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 you know, the builders said we're doing it, and uh, it turns out Ivo Van Hova is doing the Fountainhead, which will be at BAM in a few weeks, which the idea of Ivo Van Hova, you, um, I'm gonna just take a guess and say that the women will be in heels and the guys will take their shirts off, but I could be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, in fact, so that sort of was bubbling up and then in the sort of, I showed this picture to the, the builders earlier, which is mysteriously, I was coming out of Grand Central and uh, as I walked out of Grand Central, I, I made eye contact with a man who was holding up a sign that said Ayn Rand Tours of Fifth Avenue and I had somewhere to be, but I thought, oh, this would be the best, you know, $10 I ever spent. Uh, and, uh, but no, that's unfortunately lost to history, so we'll have to imagine it. Now, the, um, but, that, but that when I then went, I thought, oh, goodness, I better look up Ayn Rand. First of all, is it Ayn or Anne? It's Ayn. And uh, the, the first thing I did was naturally I went to the, the website uh, because yeah. that's how I, process information is I think there must be a website somewhere. I did also read the Wikipedia page. Um, but uh, her website, her website, right. sure. Anyway, the EinRand.org, if you go there, which is, uh, I wanna encourage you all to do it. First of all, because it will add such a uh, sort of a fun spice to your data body, so that when your data body is sold to Uber or whoever, they'll be like, wow, this is so interesting. They go to shows at the Seagull and they've been to AngRand.org. <laughs> and <laughs> AngRand.org, first of all, there's a little video which is just utterly charming, which is about, you know, oh, she's very misunderstood and really objectivism is about the idea that there is nothing beyond what is real. Okay. I thought, I'm signed up to that. I'm gonna keep scrolling. I think there's <laughs> nothing beyond what is real as well. <laughs> Check, I'm. Uh, as you keep going down though, a little, a little dialogue box appears. And I'm quite used to dialogue boxes. Uh, I work at uh, Time Out, and if any of you have ever 
tried to navigate the Time Out website, you know that it is just actually dialogue boxes all the way down. And <laughs> that this, so I was ready for it, and so it appeared in the lower left of the screen and it said, did you get what you came here for? And the one thing you can check, there's one, one option, I've gotten what I came here for. <laughs> so that's cool. <laughs> anyway, um, so the, 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 but the, the reading that I was doing was, of course, uh, eventually I, I fell down the rabbit hole of, of reading, not necessarily what Rand had written, but what has been written about her. And that the, the change in American politics, which, um, which has always seemed so bewildering to me. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a lefty, and I've always believed that, um, that, uh, that it was the only logical thing to be a lefty, uh, th that it would be very difficult, in fact, to talk yourself into being anything other than a lefty. You know, do you, what, what are you out there doing, thinking, you know, ooh, let's take away the good roads, you know, what a, what, what a bunch <laughs> of madness that would be. Uh, and that Rand, what Rand has done is she, she at the level, at the brilliant level, the brilliant level of propaganda, she marries uh, the moral passion of the left, and in fact even the worldview of the left, to rightist uh, 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 politics. By saying uh, that, that what she does is she comes to us, she says, no, no, I am an anti-Bolshevik. The Bolsheviks took everything from me. But the way that she describes the large and the small groups of society is actually quite Marxist. She, she describes them as makers and takers, which is uh, the same, in fact, <laughs> as, uh, as a communist point of view, is, is uh, that there is a class of makers and that there's a class of takers, she just inverts them. And that she also, she so convincingly makes it seem not just strange but wrong to tax, uh, that she makes it seem like uh, a painful and punishing action to ask those who have benefited to give more. That she makes it, she makes the rich a put upon group. She makes the rich a group that should be pitied. And no one likes anything as much as they like pity. Um, we pity ourselves so well. I, I remember my my nadir as a human being <laughs> was when I was in a ballet class in, uh, I'm gonna call this eighth grade, and my self-pity was total. It was <laughs> cosmic, and I don't know why, I just thought I'm so lonely, no one understands me, um, it's possible I'm gonna have to walk home from this class, you know? <laughs> I just, I don't even, I don't know how, how how no one is seeing the kind of the radiance and clarity of the pain of my situation. And so I dedicated that ballet class to myself. <laughs> and I, I did all of it, and I, and I felt that as I moved across the floor doing jetés, better on the right than on the left, um, <laughs> that people could see that there was, there was something aching and beautiful about my artistry, and I moved my own self to tears. And I think... <laughs> Uh, that was the bottom. That's what I had to rebound <laughs> from as a person. And, and when I read, uh, then a few years later, I read uh, The Fountainhead. I never made it to Alice Shrugged, but I did read The Fountainhead. And, um, okay, now be brutally honest. Brutally honest. Did anything, ooh, you know what? Let's do it Montessori style. So in Montessori, if you really agree, it's a full five, right? So let's have recess, full five. Let's not have recess, that's a one, okay? So you have a whole spectrum of response that's possible. So five is a total yes, one is an absolute no, but you have a spectrum. So on the scale of one to five, when you read Ayn Rand for the first time, five is it spoke to you, it resonated with you, you, you saw yourself in it, and it changed your life as it says in the script. One is you threw it across the room and then you flushed it down the toilet. Okay, <laughs> hands. Two, five, eight. Five, Ooh. yeah, I was somewhere in the four. Where were you? You were four, four category. I was like, yeah. yeah. You but were a five. Got, well, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to like it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. It's a page turner. Congratulations. Pop very nice. Two. It is a it is a page turner, isn't it? It really yes. is. It's a melodrama. Um, sorry, can I? It's I'm porn, sorry, I'm it's porny and rapey. We've got a one yeah. here. We have somebody fully awake. Frank, two. Um, <laughs> Frank, when did you read it? How how old were you? Beyond <laughs> high school. Beyond high school, just for the record. Okay. The now internet people, beyond high school. <laughs> That's the other title. Yep. Ayn Rand, beyond high school. <laughs> Is, uh, for me, it was very much the part about the critic in The Fountainhead, um, because the critic is described as... Um, my favorite part of his description is that he has gelatinous eyes. <laughs> and um, as someone who's asked on the reg um, if I have... Graves' disease because I had quite protuberant eyes. Um, <laughs> I was like, ooh, yeah, gelatinous eyes. And then I grew up to become a critic. So, uh, so it changed my life. Um, so the, the, thing about, the thing about the seduction of that book uh, and of, of her work in general is that it speaks to the part of ourselves which feels that we're being done wrong even when nothing wrong is happening to us. <laughs> And right. <laughs> I, I, like that ballet class, nothing was wrong, <laughs> you know? I mean, I had a Star Trek episode to go to. It was, I didn't know it was Eden, it was Eden. And, uh, and that when you look at the internet <laughs> at the moment, the idea of being done wrong by people who are not doing you wrong is the pervasive tenor of the internet common field. And, uh, there is, so what, so the reason I'm so excited that the builders are working on Rand is because even though they're not doing, as far as I know, I'll have to ask, we will ask together, um, uh, they're not doing, they're doing it in their, in the contemplative table vein as opposed to the, we, we bought a house that was foreclosed on, we built it on stage again, and then we projected literally everything on it. Um, which you could like hold up a phone and see even more projections. So, so they're micro rather than their macro aesthetic. That still, despite that, as always, what they are writing about is the internet. And they're writing about the way that our brains changed when we uh, digitized. Uh, the, uh, the, but, but, but in so many different ways, in the, in the tone of our thoughts, like the room tone of our thoughts when nothing else is happening, um, that Rand also is there describing uh, the, the fragmentation of the intellect from reason, uh, the fake reasoning that is done, uh, the fake intellectualization which she is at the core of. Uh, every time someone tells us that Steve Bannon is the intellectual powerhouse of, 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 the, of the right and you listen to the, the type of reasoning that he's doing and it reminds me so much actually of reading Rand. Can I just throw into that, you know, Paul Ryan is, is perhaps, a lot of people in the current administration profess to, to follow Ayn Rand, Paul Ryan more than anyone. More than and he's, he's our numbers guy, like he's... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and none of the numbers work. So the great thing, uh, what I loved about you guys doing the thing with the Chicago family is that she said, you know, uh, we'll also do the accent. Um, I came to America, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. I don't know, it got Irish, I'm sorry. Um, and she says that, but of course she didn't pull herself up by her bootstraps, sweet woman. Um, <laughs> she had a family in Chicago that gave her everything and supported her. And then she cut off all contact with them in her later life. She, she promised them she would pay them back and she did not. So um, one last thing that this, the piece brought up for me. I so love the story of the, of the unloved toy box. Um, the, uh, the toy box that, the, that clearly warps and, and, and um, deforms her understanding of what altruism is. Altruism is so rarely explained by taking all your favorite toys, putting them into a box, and having them <laughs> given to the poor, um, <laughs> is that Grover Norquist, do we know who Grover Norquist is? Uh, Grover Norquist is the cat who wrote the tax pledge that you have to sign if you're gonna get the full conservative I don't know, pat on the head, which is that you won't raise taxes. It's about the evil of taxes. 
And Grover Norquist, when he was a child, every time he had an ice cream cone, his father would take the ice cream cone from him and he would take a bite and he'd say, this is taxes. <laughs> okay. So that's my critical response. Now I wanted to, <laughs> now, because we have them here and they're captive and they can't get up from this chair, these chairs until we let them in 20 minutes. Uh, I thought first I wanna start asking them a few questions uh, and then I wanted to make sure that you could ask them some questions because they are currently the experts in this. So this is for you guys and for James as well. Band, your thoughts? Yep. Should I be asking? Sorry, you you're, not, you're not a Randian. Okay, all right. So uh, first question is, Another, another country heard from. Um, Sorry. First question, uh, your, if physically uh, this setup, the aesthetic setup of this is so similar to your Sontag piece. And as James said, um, Sontag was a friend of the company. But there are so many things that are similar about the two women. Um, could you talk a little bit about how working on Sontag has informed the way that you see and work with Rand? So I, I think I'm gonna pass this on to Mo if you're, if you're feeling inspired. But um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a line in this little uh, you know, workshop read that we just did, which is that, I, that all that's left for me to do is rise. And I'm doing that with my straight line decisiveness, right? That could be a line from Sontag. That's, it's, she had exactly that kind of commitment, even the same tone in, in, her, in her self, you know, she predated this word, but self-actualization. You know, it was, it was there, like she was doing this. She was gonna, as a 16 year old, Sontag was gonna go knock on the door of Thomas Mann's house in California and like present herself and force her way into the canon. And, and she did it, you know? And so I think that there's, we've always th sort of thought like uncomfortably, like, yeah, these two pieces could be like, you know, toured in rep, you know? <laughs> Despite the fact that it wears us out to be putting Sontag and Ayn Rand like in the same frame. But they are like kind of important, self-made, you know, public figures of the 20th century. And, and, and it's, I think it's, well, I'm now I'm talking myself into a corner, but it's like, it's fascinating. And, it, and there's, there's something about using the journals and this, these letters and things, you know, to, to show this process happening. And, and they, they couldn't be more different in some ways, but there, there's a drive that's, that's similar. You said it well. Um, what is, so uh, you also have the kind of the liberty to respond here in a way that maybe you wouldn't always because Marianne Weems, the director, and she, so we're waving to the live feed camera. Everybody, everybody wave. I'm Marianne. Hi, I'm Marianne. Oh yeah, but now you can talk about her because she's not here. So what, uh, how has she, so we're in a studio visit. How have you been working together? Can you talk about what she will <laughs> make you do next? What, 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 tell us the process of this. Um. Well, we, we need more money. That's what comes next, <laughs> as always. As soon as we have some more money, then we're gonna push this to the next level. But I think that we, you know, this process, um, we're sort of moving ahead, like I said before, like trying to move the pieces together. So like right now, um, Dan has been working with us in sound and atmosphere, and we, we're kind of, you know, basically almost at like table work. So I think that before we take this too much further, um, we're looking for enough money to, to get more of the designers in the room and, and start working with that. And, and so I'm not sure exactly, but, but probably not a lot more, just like pens and papers until we can push it a little further. And, and there will be visits to the Ayn Rand Institute, which is in Irvine, California, where, where all of her papers are, and uh, yeah, the, the mothership there. So I had not realized that Greenspan, so they, they talk about Greenspan um, being kind of important, but I had not realized that Greenspan was very much in the, in the circle of Rand. I mean, really. She's a member mm -hmm. of the collective. Of the collective. And, and when we say collective, we mean um, when Nathaniel Brandon who's her biggest fan, then boy toy, b then boy toy and then expelled because he um, 
dares to take an <laughs> objectivist view of their sexual relationship. Um, uh, he is expelled with extreme prejudice and Alan Greenspan writes him a letter that's like, never talk to me and my son again. I mean, it is, it's really great. So, so the, um, the, that kind of the, the world around Rand, the, the, uh, the, the cultic world around Rand, is that something you guys are gonna explore? Yeah, I mean it's it's irresistible, sure. Um, I mean, you know, the part of what what I, you know what you're alluding to is that she um, she married this guy Frank, who was an extra uh, in in one of the Cecil B. DeMille movies that she was a sort of rejected extra in, and um, he she basically uh, at some point started having this affair with with Nathaniel Brandon, and then forced all four of them, the two couples, to sit down together and explained, you know, that objectively what they needed to do was like let them keep having this affair and that that was like part of their rational situation. So, um, I mean, you've seen a little bit tonight of like the frisson of like, you know, part of it is like that she's a human being, you know, which in a way she denied, you know, and, and so I think that there's, there's some interest there. And it's a little bit of it is humor and Perian interest and a little bit of it is like, to tell us to tell this story, she has to be humanized, right? And um, so I don't know. I mean, those stories are sort of funny, but they're also kind of tragic too, right? I mean, uh, so the other thing, so they've done this project at the Performing Garage, and they were telling me a little bit about the experience of doing that, and. Uh, the thing that struck me as utterly delicious is that people took the opportunity to ask the Rands uh, questions, which they answered quasi in character. So I wondered, now that you have Rand sitting in a room with you, do any of you, particularly the fives, particularly the fives, have any questions for her? Polite questions. Polite questions. <laughs> polite, uh, polite, anybody. Anybody who has questions for Ayn? Ayn, I have a question. Yes. Uh, um, what actually works in her worldview? You've grown up to, Ayn. You've lived through the last, you know, years. Yeah. What works? What still works? Hmm. Good question. Very polite. <laughs> um, yeah, what for her, for for me, uh, well, in the end, there was social security. <laughs> for you. For me, yeah. for me, because I had paid in. So I am not taking a handout, I am just taking back what is mine. Um, yeah, I mean, she, she really held her beliefs strongly, like to the end. And um, it, it's, it's kind of amazing, you know? Like, it, she's like, a, um, you know, I made my, my decision at age six, I have not changed a bit. I had this idea when I was five years old. You know, she kind of says things like that. And I believe it, <laughs> you know? Can, yeah. I, can I say one thing as a, as a, as a one time I, yeah. five, right? Um, you know, I had spent, I've spent, you know, basically my whole life since being 17, like running away from this and, and being like, oh my God, I can't believe I ever found this seductive, right? But of course I was like a deeply self-pitying, misunderstood, you know, gay closeted teenager. And she was saying I was like the smartest person in the world and none of those other people knew what they were talking about. Anyway, <laughs> the thing is like digging back into this, right? There's a core of it that I, I still, I think that she was onto something at the core in this, in this one way, right? Which, is, which does come from her experience, and that is the ultimate and perhaps only sin for Ayn Rand, right, is coercion, right? And, and violence and coercion against a person, despite her, her kind of uh, sanctioning of like dramatic rape being okay in almost all of her books. But, um, <laughs> but at least in the, in the ph philosophical writings, coercion is the ultimate evil. And you know, her arguments about taxes are like, they come from like taking this little seed of like, you can't make somebody else do something against their will, right? And that that little seed becomes the whole philosophy, right? 
So I still, I mean, I think that, you know, as we get older and the world, we get more grays in the world and not, no longer black and white, you know, you start to look for like, okay, well, maybe in some cases it's okay to, to require someone else to do something. Or in some cases we, we owe each other as fellow human beings certain things, right? But, you know, her argument is that she's a philosopher and that you have to start from first principles and only move forwards according to principles and not just grab things out of nowhere. So there is this little element in there that I find sympathetic, which is like, yeah, you, you're coercing other people to do things against their will is wrong. That's where she starts from. She doesn't start from greed is good. So um, very impressive. I, I've been doing a documentary on the called "Observing the Observant" about the ultra orthodox Jews, and I'm wondering about Ayn Rand's uh, relationship growing up. What, how religious was her father? How strict? How much uh, structure did she have? Because she, mm -hmm. growing up, that was. Uh, her socialization that was a defining element. Did you discover any of that in your exploration? Uh, yes, I think there's much more work to be done there, her relationship to her Judaism. Um, she was secular Jew, I would say. Uh, the situation is interesting uh, in St. Petersburg at that time, right, because Jews were not allowed to live in the city of St. Petersburg. They had to live in the Russian Pale. So, uh, and this is part of her sense of loss, I think, is that her father was a prosperous um, pharmacist who owned his pharmacy and they owned the building that they lived in. And because they were special, they were allowed to live in the city. So when the revolution came and everything was taken away, everything material, I think that that was a way more bitter loss for her. Uh, but she did not, she was not a practicing Jew at all, um, as far as I know, and um, you know, left it, left it behind. Well, what about her parents? Her parents, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I I don't I don't know that much. Do you anyone? I don't anyone? Know, but yeah. I mean My understanding is it was not a practicing family. Yeah, I, I don't think that they were practicing because they would have had to go to the pale to the to shul. <laughs> yeah. Uh, does anyone have any questions for them on their construction yet? On, on how they're making the piece. On how we're making the piece. On how they're making um, so the, one of the things that has come up uh, around Rand, uh, especially, you know, when you read about the, her, her uh, sort of her very central position inside of uh, conservative thought, uh, there are, uh, what is it called, BBB and N, it's a large company that has paid uh, for a million copies of the of of is it Atlas Shrugged yeah. to be sent to high school classrooms. Um, I mean, this is kind of a Gideon Bible level investment. And there is the the thing that is to me quite uh, interesting is that she is a woman. She is a woman thinker. She is a public intellectual who is uh, a blazing a trail. Uh, for this, uh, for having a public persona, which, you know, when they were showing me the Mike Wallace interview, and she does, she absolutely has the, you know, the scariest eyes. You know, she's clearly seeing, uh, you know, the future, <laughs> and spooling in front of her. Um, that uh, that that it's actually, I think, incredibly charming that she is a woman who has completely. Uh, excused herself from this notion of glossy presentation, and that she demands um, respect at this in these in these public spheres in a way that other women were not being accorded, and honestly have not really been accorded since. She's not worrying about whether or not she sounds shrill. You know, she has a um, sh her, uh, there's something also very appealing about her as a as a woman. 
Uh, and what what did she did she ever engage with that? Did she talk about being a woman as a leader? Did she consider herself a feminist? What was she like on that front? Uh, she was not. She would not consider herself a feminist. She thought feminism was stupid and um, a waste of time. And uh, she. Yeah, no, no, no. I think she did not, I think she wanted her her gender to be invisible, you know, that like, to be neutralized somehow. Like she took these, in, the, in a similar way to Sontag actually, like I am playing at this level, you know. So that means, although Sontag I think was actually quite aware of her beauty and um, her kind of glamour, you know. Um, so, but, but ideas first, you know, absolutely. Like nobody is asking, um, you know, Thomas Mann, you know, or caring about how his mustache is trimmed or whatever, right? So, yeah. But I, I do think that there's, there's, there's something in, in what you're asking that's also connected to her kind of popularity, um, right now in the, you know, the, the people that support her, like in the national conversation right now, which is this, um, antipathy towards, I think that what you said about self-pity is totally right, but like publicly there's this antipathy towards grievance mm -hmm. and towards special pleading, mm -hmm. right? And I think that those things fit her too. And I think that she would have seen feminism, she would have seen it like as, as like, yeah, Weiner is not her style and like she's above that, you know, and, and she's not asking for any special handouts that kind of, you know, so I'm not agreeing with any of this, but I, I think that like, there may be some clue in style as to why she's not a feminist and, and distance herself from that. And yet, her, because of her, her belief system, you know, there are many parts of her belief system that, that really goes against the grain of the current conservative movement, right? Like she absolutely believed in abortion on demand. And um, she was an atheist, and you know the. I don't think I don't know that the right ha can reconcile those things, you know, um, but that makes it interesting, right? Yeah. Okay, um, so uh, a dialogue box has uh, just popped up on your screen, <laughs> um, but the only option is uh, I got what I came here for. <laughs> <laughs> so. Thank you all, and thank you to the builders. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, Marianne. Um, in light of all this, I have to acknowledge what a selfish act curating is. This is everything I could have dreamed for, and I'm so thankful for you all. Um, the last studio visit was the same. I, I tend to gush. Uh, there's another studio visit that's beginning in just a few minutes with Andre Zachary Renegade Performance Group. It's called Fire on the Mountain. It's a James Baldwin punk band. And Helga Davis is the critical respondent. Um, and I hope also you'll join us tomorrow. We have workshops in the morning. We have a new scholarship in dramaturgies. We have six new works in progress, two more studio visits, and a closing night party at VR World, which is a virtual reality arcade and bar. Um, so we have a long day all together tomorrow. And thank you again so much for, uh, for doing this with us today. And thank you all for joining us.